right, so the recording started. All right, I apologize about uh, last week uh, with the recording. Um, I know we had, uh, I don't know what happened in chapter nine in there, but when I went to edit it, so I had to send it out separately with my class lecture, but uh, I did catch the problems at the end. Um, not sure, like I said last week, we were moving into this new office and running things off of uh, my laptop. So I, uh, I do again apologize. And I think we're all moved in after the week long of working on all the snafus. So we do have everything all set. I'm um, gonna start out today with um, um, just a couple things. Um, right after class is over, um, I will be sending out the written midterm, uh, the written portion of it. Um, as the syllabus says here, we have this due, uh, I believe it's due the 21st, okay, so that would be due the 21st. Um, you can turn it any time prior to that. It is open book, so it's not too bad. Um, it'll kind of cover everything that we do up until uh, this point through today's lecture. Uh, so you will be able to answer all the questions there. Uh, next Saturday, the 24th, is our computer midterm. And I'll be sending out an email regarding this, but uh, the way I'm gonna do it this year is uh, typically I had sent it out and then had everybody try to send back. Uh, but I'm gonna try and I wanna make sure everybody is logged into Zoom that Saturday to do the computer midterm. Because um, if there's questions about it, things about procedures uh, within the software, or things like that, uh, just like I do with my class, um, classroom sessions, I give them a get out of jail free card, uh, at least one question to try to help them through things. But I uh, wanna make sure that we have uh, success on the midterm and, and for everybody and we'll, you know, again, I'll send out an email on that regarding the procedure for the 24th, okay? All right, last class, uh, we covered uh, capital gains and uh, we recovered uh, some retirement. Um, I understand the retirement. I had several questions come in uh, regarding the uh, railroad one. Um, you just don't see a lot of those. So don't get uh, too caught up and too worried about uh, the railroad uh, ones. Um, I did send out a little cheat sheet uh, that I had um, that regards the procedure of getting uh, the blue and the green uh, documents that you receive from railroad retire retirement, uh, getting those into the computer. So I hope those were helpful on everything. Okay. Um, quizzes on chapter eight and chapter nine. Uh, just looking through the questions that are in there. Um, chapter eight had capital gains. Uh, big one was, uh, you know, make sure you understand the three bases, cost adjusted and basis other than cost. Uh, make sure that you uh, big one with capital gains uh, for most individuals and, and where the confusion comes in is the uh, difference between the ownership uh, residency and uh, test and the 250 and 500,000 uh, for somebody's personal residence as the exemption so that they don't pay capital gains on that. Okay. Um, as I talked about during the lecture a little bit, um, there are quite a few instances where you know, a home may be uh, subject to capital gains uh, because of the uh, ownership. Uh, we see this a lot with life estates now, uh, where people are basically had, turning the home over to the kids, putting it in their name. Uh, mom and or dad get to live in the house. And then uh, uh, upon the passing of mom or dad, um, or put in the nursing home, the house is not subject uh, because as long as it's outside the five year look back, um, you can you know, protect that, but it does create a capital gain situation because when the house is in um, uh, the kids' names who not live there as their primary residence, then they would be subject to capital gains if they choose to sell the house upon mom and, and or dad's passing. So just make sure that we understand that from those, okay? Um, tax rates. For the capital gains, I know uh, question 11 um, in the quiz in chapter eight uh, talked about the different capital gain rates uh, that come out of the pub 17. Um, just make sure you understand how that works for the, uh, especially the ones that have to do with your personal 
income tax bracket and what capital gains are. Um, we come into play a lot of that. I did a couple consultations yesterday uh, with an individual and uh, uh, a couple that uh, had some questions because they were moving some stuff around for retirement, uh, had done some things with uh, selling some mutual funds and, uh, and their capital gains. We were making sure that you know, they could do it all in one year, or maybe they did some this year and split some off into next year. Uh, 18's uh, laws are just a little bit different as far as capital gains and the rates than uh, 17 that we see in our textbook, but uh, we were just trying to do a little tax planning to make sure that they weren't elevating their tax bill by their decisions uh, to do things in the uh, 18 tax year with capital gains, okay? Uh, chapter nine was our retirement. Um, as I said at the outset, um, this is one that, uh, you know, is kind of tough with the railroad, but uh, most of the things that we have to make sure is we understand qualified and non-qualified uh, retirement. Um, it's just kind of uh, handling of the uh, funds and when they're contributed and or distri distri distributed, uh, easy for me to say, um, due to, uh, you know, is it taxed on the way in? Is it taxed on the way out? Um, where are those funds uh, distributed from? You know, how do we calculate the taxable amount if something does not have a uh, taxable amount, but we do have the gross distribution? Talked a little bit about that simplified method um, that we use on that. Um, and also we talked about a lot because we do see people dip into their retirement, either as loans through their employer, or we see them go into them um, just as a distribution prior to 59 and a half. Uh, have to understand that there is a penalty plus the taxable. Um, sometimes they, they have the sense that there's an automatic 20% taken out federal and that covers their tax bill. It may not, depending how the rest of their tax return works. And you can never forget about New York. It's always going to want its share of the pie. So we have to make sure that, uh, you know, we understand that uh, there is implications there. And we also talked uh, with retirement about uh, how to handle it on the New York side. Uh, there's that little spot on the 1099R. Um, we'll see some more of those as we do problems. But uh, making sure that we check that little box, uh, box one, uh, is if the individual is 59 and a half. And again, 59 and a half doesn't mean they get that exemption for the entire year. If it's the year that they turn 59 and a half, we have to make sure we do an alternative calculation to only give them credit for the months that they are 59 and a half. Uh, the second box uh, that we check off is the one for the government. Uh, the third box is for future use. And again, the fourth box is railroad. And I hope that the little handout that I mailed out, emailed out to everybody, that was a big help for you for New York. Um, can get a little confusing. We talked a little bit about uh, the um, um, 414H SUB. Um, that's something that is defaulted into our software. Uh, reason being is it's such a backwards thing. Um, again, you know, when somebody contributes, and we see this with teachers and uh, federal, or, or excuse me, state employees, uh, when they're contributing into that, um, it is treated as a traditional on the federal where they are pre-tax dollars, so they're lowering their taxable income by the contribution. But on the state side, it's treated like a Roth, and that contribution is taxed as part of income on the way in. So it's kind of a little quirky the way that they handle it, but uh, that's the way New York has chosen to handle that, um, that, that um, contribution to retirement. And again, that's for that 414H SUB, okay? All right, any questions on anything um, regarding exercises or problems, or excuse me, exercises and quizzes, eight and nine? Um, well, the other thing is don't forget about the rollovers. Uh, how to handle all those different rollovers within the 60 days and such, okay? All right. Any questions on anything from the exercises or quizzes? Okay. Can I send answers to the quizzes and uh, exercises? problems? Yeah, I'll send out uh, for, let's see, I, I think I've sent out through seven. 
Um, I'll send out today eight and nine um, so that you have those. And uh, I'll do that on the break. So if you want to take a look at them and you have any questions as far as the uh, income amount or the refund amounts or what they owe, uh, I'll send those out. Um, if you ever have a question about uh, seeing one, um, I know I just sent out the answers and we do a few of them on, on the line too. Um, let me know because sometimes in my classroom sessions, I will print uh, the PDF of the return uh, to show the forms. Obviously, it's not as good as showing it actually in the computer um, to see it, but uh, always let me know. And if anybody has, uh, you know, again in the chat, I print this out at the end, but uh, in the chat, if there's any of them that anybody would like me to send out uh, the printout of the PDF so you can see where things are on the 1040 and what forms have been generated, uh, please do not hesitate to do that. So that sometimes works out well for that, okay? And I try to pick out problems uh, through five. I thought I sent out six and seven. If I didn't, I'll do that on the break. And actually I'll send out through nine for you, okay? Because I do have those here with me, all right? Okay. Thank you for that, Pat. And again, like I said, if anybody wants PDFs of any of the problems, you know, throw them out there in the, the, the um, uh, chat down um, that you can chat and type on there, okay? And like I said, you know, don't hesitate. Uh, the chat works great, but uh, don't hesitate if there's something that you really want to jump on to unmute and uh, jump in there because you never know. You might not be the only one. You may not be alone as far as um, the questions on um, anything that we have as far as things that we're discussing, so, okay. All right, um, just looking through eight and nine, um, weren't too bad. Um, a little trivia for you. I hope that you appreciated the names in chapter eight. Um, for those of you that uh, are my age or older, um, I'm sure Will Robinson, um, came to mind. So the danger Will Robinson, if anybody remembers the computer, uh, the robot from Will Robinson. And another little uh, trivia on that one, the uh, Smith Barney, the brokerage account, that was 250 shares of Moon Pies. And uh, I will give uh, a free, extra free get out of jail free card if anyone can tell me where the Moon Pie was invented, okay? And I'll give you a clue. The moon pie was invented in the birthplace of my father, okay? So anybody that knows me, but uh, that, uh, the, the birthplace of the moon pie, if anybody can figure that one out. And I guess I give you time to Google for those of you that are on your phones right now, type in Google and saying, where was the moon pie um, invented, okay? Uh, we had Ike and Tina, again, you know, most of the stuff we had on there in that chapter eight was talking about stock transactions. Um, I know there was a little curve somebody had asked me about Will Robinson, and there was a bullet point that he decided to see the, R the world in his RV. He sold his house for 133. He lived in the house for 14 years. He paid 65. Uh, he had receipts for 48.5 in capital improvements and he paid 3,500 real estate taxes before closing. Um, that one was a little bit of a um, kind of a um, false, if you will, uh, bullet point, because the, the big subject of that was the second, excuse me, the third sentence, that he said he lived in the house for 14 years, being his primary residence, unless that capital gain exceeded 250,000, all the other was just fluff, okay? All right, um, let's see, in the problems in chapter nine, we had, uh, well, we did L. L. Merler. Um, Ralph and Bernice, we had the retirement there for them. That was the one with the railroad. Again, um, hopefully, um, hopefully the, the cheat sheet, like I said, the big thing is, is to treat the blue like a social security statement, and that goes on that 1040 worksheet. Uh, worksheet one, and the railroad, uh, the green, or tier two as they call it, uh, you treat that one like a 1099R, and it goes on the pension line. 
So make sure that you just realize that it's really just getting two separate documents. Sometimes it gets a little crazy when you're thinking that their retirement and all these extra boxes and stuff. But again, that cheat sheet that I gave out uh, last week or emailed uh, has how you handle that on the federal as far as those for the railroad, okay? Um, again, always make sure you check out your bullet points. Uh, I know the problem with the rights had some stock transactions in there and some of them did not have the basis reported, but sometimes that is in the bullet points because you will get that where you have to ask the client, um, you know, at the basis. Um, you know, I think I brought up the case of the, the lady that I did that had a stock, tra stock transaction for stock that she had owned when she lived in Oklahoma. Uh, going back to the 70s and uh, the basis for it, she was able to chase it down, but it came to us typed on a piece of paper that was Xerox. And you could tell it was typed on an old Smith Corona with all the little correction whiteout things on it. So, it, uh, you know, some people keep good records of that. Make sure you do. All right. I had an answer of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, somewhat true. All right. But the original moon pie was invented in Ottawa, Iowa. Um, it's just outside of Omaha, Nebraska, or um, uh, Ottawa, Iowa is a little place that uh, in the 1950s had what was known as the widest main street in the country. I know Lockport used to have the widest bridge, um, but Ottawa, Iowa had the widest main street. They sold moon pies on one side, there's a movie theater on the other side, and the population of the town was never gotten above 3,500. And uh, the um, Main Street itself was about six lanes wide, so, okay. But good guess, Pat, thank you, okay. All right, anybody have any questions, again, about anything from eight and nine before we get into what we're doing here with, uh, today we're gonna get into itemized deductions and uh, we'll see how we do for time, but we might do a little bit of the uh, adjustments uh, for income, okay. All right. Okay, and again, you know, type in the chats or like I said, you can unmute and holler if you need to, okay? All right. Okay, so we're gonna talk, we're gonna talk about uh, itemized deductions. Uh, we, we broke it into two parts. Uh, basically, what we did is we broke the sections of the um, Schedule A, which is basically where we're going to be for these next two chapters uh, for itemized deductions. Uh, it does talk a little bit about standard deductions and such, but we're going to start out with the itemized deductions. And we're going to start at the top, basically, of the Schedule A and work our way down. Now, this is the chapter where I will probably do the most um, interjections of things that come from the new tax law because this is where we really see a lot of the changes with the tax law is uh, on the personal side is for things on the uh, Schedule A and how the deductions that people can take. Uh, we've talked about a few of the other things for 2018 tax laws versus 17. Um, the one thing I have noticed um, just with describing people um, and consulting people about their 18 tax return is that it is very important that they understand how 17 worked so that they know what the base is for the changes that we're making. If I just tell them straight out what the 18 tax code is, um, I sometimes will get that little bit of a deer in the headlight look and they'll look at me and go, you know, you're not helping me here, okay? So if they understand that, uh, you know, the standard deduction is one way in 17 and a new way in 18, and what that change has made, um, then sometimes they have a good reference point to start their understanding of what's going to happen with their 2018 tax return. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about, um, you know, as this chapter is called, it is called itemized, excuse me, it's called uh, st itemized deductions. But we first have to understand the standard because that is what we are putting this against, um, the standard deduction. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, when it's advantageous for a taxpayer to itemize. Uh, we're gonna talk about medical and dental expenses, you know, the first section of a Schedule A for 
itemized deductions. Uh, we're going to talk about tax and interest expenses, uh, kind of the middle two sections. Um, the fourth section um, on Schedule A, we're going to talk about charitable expenses, okay? And we'll talk about that in this chapter, all right? All right, starting out, first thing we got to understand is for 17, standard deduction. And if we remember back in our discussion about the filing threshold, we talked about the fact that the filing threshold is basically your filing status to get the standard deduction plus that exemptions, okay? We can see the little table there that says single or married filing separate, their standard deduction is 63.50, okay? So that would be the standard deduction on uh, their uh, 2017 tax return, okay? Now, that will change for 2018 because that goes up to 12,000, okay? So, you know, make sure that you understand that there is a change, all right? that they will go to do on their 2018 tax return, okay? So basically most of it is just doubling down on everything, all right? So they will have a standard deduction. Now, that is the only thing they will have. You will no longer have exemptions for the individual on the tax return, okay? So that 4,050 that we would see for the exemption disappears and they just have increased the standard deduction, all right? Married filing joint, 24,000, out of household, 18,000. So again, you know, 2018. So if you want it to the right in that table, uh, meaning the margins, if you want to write 2018, um, then you can write down what the, uh, the different uh, thresholds are for each of those. So I'll give you a second just to get to that page. We're on page, uh, let's see here, what is this? This is 10-4 in our textbook okay so if everybody can get there okay and like I said for single person it's now 12,000 married filing joint 24,000 and head of household is 18,000. So that's the new standard deduction. They do no longer get the, the personal exemptions that we saw in 17 for 18, okay? Now, just as we had in the past, uh, the next little table that we come down, whoops, too far, that we come down with there, there is adjustments uh, based on your age, okay? So there's adjustments to that uh, based on the age. In 2017, we saw an extra uh, 12,000, or excuse me, $1,250 for married filing joint, or $1,550 um, for those over 65 blind, um, different things that we'd see right there that may be uh, checked on the top of the 1040 page two, okay? So for a single person, they would add uh, 1550 to their standard deduction, and for married filing joint in 2017, they would have added uh, $1,250 to each for each person, okay? Now, for 2018, we still see that. Um, it has gone up a little bit. Uh, for married filing joint, they would have the 24,000, and then you get to add 1,300 for each person over 65, um, the standard uh, for the taxpayer and the spouse. Uh, for single or head of household, if you have somebody that qualifies for that extra uh, uh, amount on their standard deduction, it is 1600 okay? So that's for 2018. But just know that, uh, you know, that standard deduction is increased for somebody over 65. As the circle shows there on the top of 10-5, um, we see that the, um, you know, if they were 65, blind, whatever it may be, they have those extra boxes. That's where that extra um, bump on their standard deduction comes in. So basically, when we talk about the standard deduction, if you have somebody that is uh, married filing joint, um, their standard deduction, if they're both over 65, is going to be 26,600, which is a lot of money. And you know that's a thing that with uh, the new tax law that uh, there's a sense that the um, itemizing of deductions is almost going away. That's how they're trying to get everybody onto the infamous postcard. 
However, doesn't mean that it's going to be totally going away. Um, I think I brought up last time that uh, we had attended a seminar, uh, some of us, with the uh, state of New York. And the state of New York is basically kind of thumbed up their nose, if you will, at the uh, federal. And they're going to just keep and, and let everybody itemize their deductions the way they always have in the past with no restrictions. So we're going to have almost two sets of laws in 18 for itemized deductions, one for the federal and one for the state. Whereas in 17, the things that happened on the federal itemized deductions flowed to the state and uh, there was kind of a seamless uh, relationship between the two. That will not exist for 2018, okay? All right, so we talked about the standard deduction, okay? Now we're gonna get into itemized deductions. They share the same line, uh, but this is where we have to take a look and make the comparison um, of the itemized versus the standard deduction, okay? And, you know, I know when I work with my clients, a lot of times, especially if it's a new client, they'll come in and say, oh yeah, I always itemize. I always do this, this, and this. Well, sometimes it's the case that uh, they may have given the documentation to the tax preparer to, for itemizing, but once you put those in, if we find that the standard deduction is greater, we're gonna take that, okay? We're gonna take the standard over the itemized. And I will still do for my clients, even clients of mine that come back, I will still go through the exercise of the itemized and explain to them, well, here's where your itemized is. We're going to take the greater of the two, which is the standard deduction. And I may ask them, and, and one of the things that goes dollar for dollar that we're going to talk about today towards itemized deductions is uh, charitable contributions, uh, making sure that they have kept uh, track, a good track of what they've given to the church, uh, items they may have donated to the goodwill. Uh, sometimes we talked earlier about the inheritance of a house, uh, making sure they did a good job taking inventory of cleaning the belongings out of mom and dad's that nobody wanted, that they gave to Goodwill, Salvation Army, AMVETS, whatever that may be, and making sure that we have a good uh, list of that so that uh, we can do a little extra on their uh, itemized deductions, okay? All right. We are going to talk about uh, the best time when itemize is when we have high out-of-pocket medical, uh, get above the threshold. Obviously, knock on wood, we don't want anybody to have a medical thing that would allow us to itemize strictly on the medical, but we are going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about state and local income taxes. Um, this is that salt, if you will, that uh, comes into play that you hear so much about for 18. Uh, state and local taxes, real estate taxes, property taxes, the such. Um, those are ones we're going to be able to itemize. Uh, no limitation in 2017. Uh, however, in 2018, the SALT area is going to be limited to 10000 And again, it's made up of that state tax. And if you will, the state tax may be what's withheld on your W-2, plus your real estate property taxes and the such. Okay. Uh, mortgage interest, obviously a big one. Changes for, uh, or for 17, we had uh, mortgage interest. The change that happened in 17, we got halfway through the tax season and they decided to put mortgage insurance premiums back into the law. So we had a ton of, uh, of um, amendments to do. In fact, we had a stretch of about a week and a half where we had to hold all the returns while the IRS fixed the uh, uh, electronic filing so that the returns would be accepted with mortgage insurance premiums on it. Um, so we have that. Like I said, gifts to qualifying charities and uh, casualty uh, theft or losses, okay? So we're going to talk about those, all right, okay? All right, medical expenses, medical and dental expenses. May should probably put vision on there too, but uh, as we talk about, you know, there's out-of-pocket medical and dental expenses can be deducted on a Schedule A. And for 2017 and 18, uh, the amount has to exceed 7.5% of their AGI. You know, that AGI is, uh, if you will, the bottom line 37 or the top 38 of the 1040, uh, page 2, 38, that they have to take 7.5% and they have to exceed that. Now, it does say regardless of age. If you go back a couple years when the ACA was first implemented, it used to be 7.5% uh, for anybody um, under, excuse me, over 65. Everybody under 65 was 10%. 
but that has changed uh, that it's now just a standard seven and a half percent. Okay, so somebody makes a you know a hundred thousand dollars, you know they have seventy five hundred that they have to get past before they can itemize uh, or use excuse me add the medical and dental and vision to their itemized deductions. Now getting past the seven and a half doesn't mean they get to count all of it. Only what exceeds seven and a half. So if they make $100,000, they have $7,500 threshold, they have $7,600 in out-of-pocket medical expenses, they only get to count $100, okay? So it's only what exceeds it, all right? So make sure everybody understands that. It's not a threshold where you get over and then you can take it all and add it, but basically it's only gonna add to your um, itemized deductions when you exceed the uh, standard amount, okay? Okay, medical expenses, all right? A lot of times people don't realize all of the things that can be added into medical. We're gonna go through them here shortly in a second as far as what can be counted, and sometimes people are surprised, but there's quite a few things. Uh, it talks about whose medical expenses can be included. Uh, great little exercise on this, and it talks about um, when uh, medical expenses that the taxpayer paid for the, themselves, as well as those paid for their spouse or dependent, either when the services were provided or when paid, okay? Um, you can, uh, additional people whose medical expenses can be included, even though not a dependent, as it says in parentheses, a child not claimed due to the rules of children of divorces or separated parents, any person who could be claimed except for the, of the uh, 40, 4,050 AGI limit, and taxpayer spouse if filing joint can be claimed as a dependent on someone else's return, okay? Like I said, great little exercise here, uh, 10A that goes through those things that can be, uh, or those uh, bills and how they would be handled, so we'll let you work on that, okay? Um, medical insurance premiums, they can be included, but the only ones that come over really from a tax document per se, are the ones for Medicare. Um, if somebody has um, insurance that is deducted from their pay, um, that is usually pre-tax dollars, so you've already taken the advantage of it on your W-2, so you don't get the lowering of your pre-tax for paying for health insurance plus having it go towards your itemized, a double dip if you will. But uh, Medicare, since it's taken out of your pay there, um, you do get to take it over to the um, Schedule A. Long-term care insurance premiums, okay? Uh, these are those uh, policies, and I don't know if anybody has one, but they have gotten very expensive. But these are ones that, um, that you buy for long-term care. Um, those premiums are deductible. Um, put it in there. Um, even if you know somebody's not itemizing, it is a great one because sometimes they may not get a benefit for it on the federal, but it's handled a little bit differently on the state that uh, those long-term care can prevent because it kind of acts like a non-refundable credit on the state in New York to eat up their tax bill. So make sure that uh, you know when you're putting in those long-term care, just because it may not work on the uh, Schedule A on the federal, that you do get it in there so that that can be used on the state side, okay? All right, um, qualifying medical and dental expenses, okay? Obviously, you get in here and you can see all these different things that are on here um, that, uh, you know, a lot of them you typically think of. Uh, sometimes the ones that, uh, you know, for people, I will think outside the box. I remember a client I had one time that came in for a consultation and I looked at the return and as we had a discussion, I was discovered that her husband had uh, developed MS and they had to do several uh, modifications to their home for him to be able to live at home. And uh, as you can see, there's one that's called capital expenses for equipment or improvements to your home needed for medical care. Now, you know, they had to do some things where they had to widen the doors, uh, they added a wing, uh, the bathroom was changed, uh, the front door entrance, uh, the bathroom had to have a special bathtub, all because of the medical care for him to be able to live at home. So sometimes you gotta really think outside the box on this, okay? Um, I always get the question when I, ask a client, do you have any dependents? And they will say, yes, I have a dog, can I claim them? 
and I will look back at them seriously and say, yes, you may. Is the dog a guide dog or a, for somebody that's deaf, blind, or a service dog for somebody that has a medical disorder? Um, on the itemized, the care of that dog, you know, the vet, the um, uh, food, uh, grooming, everything to take care of that animal, if it is something that is for a medical condition, is deductible on your medical. So there's a chance for everybody that would like to be able to deduct their dog that they can get it on there. You can't deduct them as a dependent, but you can put them on the itemized, okay? Uh, another one that they talk about often is uh, that people don't realize is some of those meals, lodging uh, during hospital uh, treatment, things like that, even for the spouse. Uh, say somebody is uh, referred to the Cleveland Clinic for procedure and the spouse goes down and has to stay uh, there to uh, take care of them and bring them back after the procedure. Well, those are things that uh, would, would fall into that space, okay? All right, uh, some of the other stuff again, medical equipment. Don't be afraid to think outside the box there. Again, we kind of get caught up on medical treatment and kind of forget about medical equipment, okay? So we have things on that. Um, the one that sometimes gets a little funny is things for um, weight loss. Um, if it's weight loss is ordered by your doctor to treat a medical condition or obesity problem, that's one thing. If it's just saying, hey, you need to lose 20 pounds to be healthy, that's different, okay? So you gotta make sure that you understand, you know, how it is treated as far as the weight loss, okay? Um, just because, I uh, guess what's the trending one, the keto diet or whatever that is, um, just because somebody is on that um, and maybe has been uh, prescribed that by their doctor, that might be one thing. So we have to make sure that we understand how that goes, okay? Um, operations. For, um, I had a client uh, that, uh, again, a little anecdote here. I had a client that uh, came in, um, had done the individual the year before, um, to verify identity, I was handed the driver's license, and on the driver's license uh, was the name Kevin, and uh, across from me sat a Kristen, okay? Um, so this individual had a uh, gender reassignment surgery, I guess would be the way to say it, and with that uh, surgery, that is deductible only if it is done in order to treat a gender identity disorder. Um, in order for me to deduct this, I did ask the individual to get me a letter from their psychologist, psychiatrist type thing, and we were able to um, have that individual um, generate the letter for me so that we had uh, proof that it was done for a gender identity disorder. And with that being said, it was uh, able to be deducted. Now, I guess I'm going to put this as politically correct as I can. Um, in order to deduct things, it has to be, uh, I guess for the lack of better words, a, the base model, okay? Uh, no bells and whistles. So again, cosmetic surgery, you cannot deduct. So if it's somebody that's had a gender reassignment or something for a gender identity disorder, it has to be just the base model. You can't get any bells and whistles, okay? So... We went through everything that they had, and, and all said and done, um, out of pocket, because a lot of it had not been covered by the individual's insurance, there was about an extra $22,000 that we were able to put on their itemized deductions. Now, again, not a dollar for dollar. We're talking about a deduction, so it's not like it lowered their tax bill by $22,000, but uh, did lower their taxable income, so it did help them out on their tax bill, okay? Um, each one of these is kind of... Uh, you know, in these next few sections, it talks about uh, some of the things that you can claim. Um, you know, it gives a little bit more detail and explanation um, that, that helps you understand what each one is and what can be done for those. Um, you know, transportation's a big one. Um, you know, the thing is, is a lot of people for transportation with their mileage, um, if they're driving themselves for treatment, that's one thing with the mileage. Um, if it's a case that uh, sometimes Medicaid in New York will cover your transportation, that is not an out-of-pocket, okay? Because the expenses, um, you know, really aren't yours. They're being paid by somebody else's, okay? 
Um, we talked about the health insurance that you cannot or anything that is reimbursed. So if you have a health savings account, um, again, pre-tax dollars that you have, um, you know, those cannot be deducted on there because you're paying already with uh, tax-free dollars in your health savings account, okay? All right, so we have all those. And again, these sections are just kind of talking about all the different explanations on everything that uh, has uh, with the different medical expenses and such, uh, what can and can't be deducted and kind of distinguishing those, okay? All right, taxes paid. Oop, hold on one second here. Um. Uh, Okay, so obviously we have some in the crowd with the back problem, and they want to know if they can get a new jacuzzi for Christmas and have it paid for, okay? Um, yes, um, that is one of those things that uh, there are, if it's a treatment and prescribed, um, you know, that uh, individual has a chronic uh, back problem um, that they have for the um, um, let me get the, the textbook out and I'll kind of tell you what it says about it. But if it's uh, really something that is part of the treatment, okay? And as it says here, let's see here. All right. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Ba -ba. All right, let me find it here and I'll read it to you. Well, I can't find it in there, but yes, that is the case if somebody has a chronic back problem, uh, that that is something that would be able to um, have them be able to uh, deduct that, okay? So I guess if you wanna put that on your Christmas list and whoever's getting it for you, um, you can tell them that uh, you, you know, if you can itemize your deductions, you would be able to um, have that uh, as part of the uh, deductible, okay? I don't know where that went in there. It used to be in the old book. Okay. Probably would have to go under something with the capital improvements uh, that we talked about, things like that. But uh, yes, you know, you'd obviously have to be very careful and make sure you had documentation on everything to be able to make sure on that. Okay. All right. Any other questions on anything about the medical? Like I said, don't be afraid to think outside the box. Uh, the one I talked about with the gender reassignment uh, and the gender identity disorder. I actually had to go find a legal case within tax code uh, to be able to give me the, the specifics and how I was to handle that. Um, so sometimes it takes a little research and, but you know, the individual, and it was obviously a sensitive situation. Um, it was a huge help because of the procedure. There was limited income that year because they weren't unable to work and uh, really helped them out. So, okay. All right, because we had a little lower threshold with their gross income, so it was easier to deduct more of it when we had to get past that 7.5%, okay? All right, taxes you paid. Again, this is where we're getting into that SALT, state and local taxes that you paid, okay? Um, you know, obviously there's the income taxes that uh, those are the ones that are typically taken out of your W-2. Um, New York State Disability Insurance, that is a tax, that little $31.20 that everybody sees annually come out of their paycheck if that's uh, what their employer does. So we have that. Um, we have uh, real estate taxes, uh, both property and school. Uh, a lot of times those taxes paid uh, for most individuals will show up on a 1098 for their mortgage because uh, their property taxes are in escrow. So they'll see that. And there is a sales tax, okay? Obviously, uh, we in New York feel like we pay more than our share of sales tax, so we always feel like we should be able to deduct the extra. But uh, most of the time, it's very difficult because you have to choose between the income tax that is coming out of your W-2 or, or what you pay 
throughout the year um, in, in the taxes there versus uh, what your, um, your uh, sales tax is, okay? Um, a lot of times uh, the sales tax is beneficial when you're talking about somebody that is retired or semi-retired because a lot of times they don't have tax withheld from anything uh, for retirement that we saw in chapter nine. So you can do that. And then uh, in 17, one thing you can do is there is a section where you may add, uh, besides the calculation for the general sales tax deduction, you can add uh, sales tax paid on a new car or an RV, or I guess if you're so inclined, a helicopter, a yacht, something like that. Um, sometimes you can do that. And then obviously there's a section for sales tax. If you have that individual that comes in with their little shoebox and they have added every penny of sale tax off of every receipt that they've paid all year long. Okay. So those are the taxes that uh, you can deduct. Great little table talks about ones you can and can't deduct there. Okay. All right. Uh, we talked about income taxes. Um, that goes on there. General sales tax, again, we talked a little bit about that. We'll kind of see, uh, we'll, when we get into problems, uh, we'll make sure that, uh, just make a note to myself here, that we will do that uh, general sales tax worksheet. I'll show you how that works um, and the calculation of it. There's a little thing here that comes up um, on the next page that talks about, doo -doo -doo. As a little table there for the sales tax and stuff, um, you know, just for reference for everybody, we're a B in New York because of our county, okay? We're a B, letter B, but on the sales tax worksheet, and we'll show you how that works. Like I said, very rarely does anything benefit anybody on the sales tax um, because of uh, the high withholding and income tax. But again, if we're on a state, you know, when we have our students that are in Florida, um, that sales tax can be beneficial to somebody because they have no state income tax. So that local state local tax for them is the sales tax. Um, so we can make sure we do the general sales tax calculation. Okay. Uh, real estate taxes um, talks about that uh, we can deduct these. Uh, real estate taxes, again, are taken on the Schedule A. Um, be very careful if somebody, even with their primary residence, even though we may not have a capital gain situation, make sure again, you look at that HUD-1 or that closing statement so that you can see, because it may have been the case with the way school taxes and property taxes fall um, at due at different times and on the closing, they may be reimbursed from the house they're selling uh, for sales taxes that would show up out of their escrow or what they were uh, paid. So you have to be very careful because you don't want to create a situation for a client where you're going to have a double dip, if you will. Okay, so make sure that you pay close attention to all that. All right, um, like I said, um, you know, we have those most of the time mortgage escrows, they have them where they're on the 1098, they're right there for you. Um, if anybody wants to make a note um, in New York, um, if you type the city name and then the letters O A R S, um, it's called ORS, it's a kind of a standardized system. Uh, for the uh, uh, municipalities and the, the different counties and such. Um, it's a way to look up uh, sales, or excuse me, real estate taxes, uh, maybe for a previous year. Uh, sometimes they'll have the current year and what was billed. Um, the other thing is most of the mortgage companies, uh, if we know what the mortgage company is, uh, during tax season when you dial into the mortgage and call them, um, you can get uh, an automated line with the uh, the uh, loan number and uh, find out what they paid in property taxes. Okay, so those are a couple resources for you. All right. Uh, we talked about personal property taxes. Okay, other taxes, again, you know, taxes that we may be paid, uh, you know, uh, one that always comes to mind is that little New York State Disability Insurance, the 3120 that we paid. Okay. All right, interest. All right, we're pretty limited on interest. Um, we can do the interest that we paid, um, obviously, on the home mortgage interest. Um, we're not talking about interest that's on anything that has uh, personal debt, if you will. So credit card interest is not, or uh, vehicle loan interest, those are not the interest we're talking about. We're talking about home mortgage interest, 
and uh, home equity lines of credit uh, that are being held by the home and secured by the main home, okay? Um, that is 17. 18, the rules change a little bit, okay? Uh, some of that interest that we would traditionally think of that's involved with our home equity um, is a little bit more restricted in 18 because that loan, that home equity line of credit must be used for improvements or capital improvements that were used to improve the house. If somebody takes out a home equity line of credit to pay off student loans, some credit cards, and maybe some other debt, then that is not deductible, okay? So you have to be very careful. 18 is gonna have a little bit different rules there, okay? So, you know, a lot of people that have taken out these home equity loans um, to do things uh, to consolidate debt because of low interest rates, uh, the rules for deducting that in 18 have changed from what we traditionally thought and the benefits that were there. Okay. All right. Um, in case anybody has, in most cases, the taxpayer can deduct all home mortgage interest if itemizing. However, the deduction may be limited if the mortgage balance is more than a million dollars. And bad news for those of you that have a million dollar mortgage, that limit is 750,000 in 2018. So for those of you that are taking the class right now that have a mortgage on your home of $750,000 or more, there's a limitation there. Um, good question about uh, should we request receipts from the client for the home equity? Actually, uh, the 1098s are supposed to be a little bit more descriptive for 2018. Um, you know, there's gonna be a little bit more um, we're actually talking about uh, for our waiting room forms that they complete prior to coming in for the tax return. Uh, we're going to add some questions and kind of a little simplified worksheet for them to describe, uh, you know, outside of their home mortgage, if they have a home equity line of credit as to what that was used for. Uh, we just have to ask the questions. Um, yes, you know, to, to answer your question, we may have to seek receipts or, you know, uh, really documentation. Um, you know, I don't know if this is something that the IRS is going to scrutinize more as things go along. Okay. Uh, points, you know, we can deduct those. Uh, typically, again, they're on the 1098. A lot of times they're added right in with the mortgage interest. Okay. But we can deduct those. All right. Um, be careful on somebody that I see down here. We talk about refinance loans. Uh, a lot of times people come in, they're kind of used to bringing in one mortgage statement. If they refinanced or their uh, mortgage was sold, make sure that they have both um, 1098s from both uh, institutions that uh, do in the loan. Um, it's just an important one. Uh, I've had people, what I've had to amend them, where they come back and says, you know what? I thought that seemed low. We refinanced, but and I knew our interest rate had dropped, but it seemed low. Well, they had forgotten to get the mortgage interest statement from the prior uh, lender uh, and bring it in. So we had to amend the return. Uh, mortgage insurance premiums, again, 17, they're there. 18, they're there as far as we know. This is one that tends to have nine lives. It comes and goes. Um, there is a limit on the deductible amount. You can see some thresholds there. Um, so sometimes even if uh, uh, last year in 17 when they put, uh, actually it happened about mid-February, about halfway through the filing season, we had to put mortgage insurance premiums back in. Uh, when we did that, um, we had uh, uh, to amend, again, we held a bunch of them, and some of them um, we had to say it doesn't matter, and they said yes it does, they put it back in, we said no, because there's this phase out because of where their income threshold was that they did not get to take the mortgage insurance premiums, okay? Um, it talks about investment interest. Uh, you see a little bit of that, uh, sometimes more so those are things that may uh, uh, come over from a K-1 um, with things that they had uh, through a partnership, um, an estate, a trust, something like that, okay? As we talked about, interest that cannot be deducted, uh, personal interest, service charges, credit card fees, uh, loan fees, credit investigation, um, it does say mortgage insurance premium and VA fundings, put a line through that. Um, again, that was put back in. Uh, interest to purchase or uh, carry tax exempt securities, okay? So again, you know, those are interests that we cannot put on the Schedule A, 
okay? And a big one we always have questions with is, is car loans and credit card interest uh, type of a personal ones, okay? All right, uh, I have a little couple of lecture sizes for you just to kind of distinguish things, okay? All right, gifts to charity. A lot of times I will tell my clients if they're looking for a charitable contribution to make, I'm happy to give them my routing number and account number for my bank account, and uh, they can uh, do that. Um, the only thing is, contributing to me is not a gift to charity because I am not a recognized or qualified organization. I have not established myself as a tax-exempt 501c3, okay? However, that would be a gift, and they give me more than 15000 they would have to do a gift tax return. And when I inform them of that, then they've decided not to contribute to me, okay? But if we do make gifts to charity that are charitable contributions, we have to make sure it is a qualified organization, okay? Um, I can remember there for a while, uh, some things going on uh, when we had a few different things happen around Buffalo. Um, on WBEN, I can remember Sandy Beach uh, talking to Esther about uh, the whole GoFundMe pages, okay? A lot of times, those GoFundMe pages are not charitable contributions because they are not going to a qualified organization, okay? So making a contribution to a GoFundMe or something like that is not a charitable contribution, okay? Um, again, qualified organizations include nonprofits that are religious, charitable, educational, scientific, or literary in purpose that work to prevent cruelty to children or animals, okay? Um, they must be a qualified organization with the IRS. And obviously, if there's somebody with very high charitable contributions, the IRS may ask to see documentation. Uh, the state of New York loves to scrutinize over this one, okay? And as I told my classroom session the other day, um, the IR, or excuse me, New York State, um, not only do they want to see receipts that you made the contribution, and again, we had an individual where we provided canceled checks written to the organization. We had to go to the organization and ask for a letter from the organization saying that that money was actually given to them, okay? So, believe it or not, again, state of New York said, well, cancel checks written to the church, not good enough. We need a letter from the church that says you made those contributions. So, obviously, they, you know, kind of puts the taxpayer or the client in an awkward position because now they have to go to the church and say, hey, I need a letter that I actually gave you money, okay? So, you know, sometimes it gets a little bit, a uh, little bit much. Okay. Uh, examples of charitable contributions. You know, again, things like this. Uh, the big ones that are not deductible. Any time, I guess, to make a general statement. Any time it has to do with something where you are receiving something in return. Okay. Um, sound here talks about cost of raffle. You have to be very careful when you're buying that. Uh, meat raffle for the local volunteer fire department or something like that because if you're making that contribution and you're just buying the raffle ticket thinking hey i'm buying a 25 dollars raffle ticket to support my volunteer fire department if there's an expectation of something in return you have to be very careful okay because those are not charitable contributions because you are expecting something in return um, just like giving to uh, some of these civic um, uh, chamber of Commerce, things like that. If that money is going towards an organization that is maybe uh, has uh, political influence, I guess would be the way to say it, you have to make sure that you're very careful there, okay? Also, make sure that uh, there's nothing that you have that uh, your time or service. Um, we obviously, for volunteer work, we have to have um, um, people that, uh, you know, maybe are, are coaching a soccer team, things like that, has to be very careful with that. Um, I have heard instances where people have been scrutinized on this for volunteer work um, for a, you know, they're running a youth uh, football program. And, you know, they're donating uniforms, doing this, they're coaching, stuff like that. Well, the IRS kind of scrutinized it a little heavy because their child was participating in the league, okay? so. 
this kind of puts a little bit of a snafu, if you will, because then you have to say, well, is this person really volunteering in their time or would they be there anyway because their child is participating, okay? So again, you have to kind of ask the extra questions as to what. What is their expect expectation? Um, are they receiving anything in, in return, okay? Uh, cash contributions, again, canceled checks, credit card statements, things like that. I guess now in this eyes of New York State, uh, you must um, provide a letter from the organization. Uh, we have somebody going through an audit. Like I said, they had all the canceled checks and we sent them in and the New York State said, nope, not enough. You need a letter from every organization saying that you contributed. Um, what it boils down to is they just didn't want to give them their, their, um, their uh, refund, okay? Uh, payroll deduction, another great one. A lot of times you see a lot of the organizations around here participate with the United Way and their payroll deduction. It's going to be on the W-2, so make sure you pick up on that, okay? All right. Um, you know, if you have somebody that has um, a gift of 250 or more, uh, make sure that you're listing separately what those contributions are, okay? All right, non-cash contributions, all right? These are the ones where we're giving household items, all right? And I realized when we go through mom and dad's house uh, that we're giving away items that uh, nobody had wanted or things like that or did not sell and we're going to give them uh, to a charitable organization, a qualified, I should say, organization. Um, just because it has sentimental value of X number of dollars does not mean that it has a fair market value of the same amount, okay? Uh, the Goodwill, and there's a list in here, has a very good list of giving value to things uh, as far as fair market value for things contributed. And again, just because, you know, it's this tea set that nobody wanted and couldn't sell at the garage sale, but, you know, hey, I remember that. That was a wedding gift that great grandma got and uh, it has a lot of sentimental value. That does not determine the fair market value, okay? So make sure that you are going through those to determine uh, the fair market value on everything, okay? Um, uh, Non-cash contributions, record keeping. Um, one of the things I tell everybody, especially in an instance where you're cleaning out the house and giving a bunch of stuff and AMVETS is backing up the truck, um, use your cell phone, okay? Uh, you can write a list, but use your cell phone. Take pictures um, somehow and print out pictures so that, you know, if, if it's the case that, you know, somebody comes back and wants to scrutinize what you contributed, that you make sure you got pictures of it, okay, so that you have that. Um, once you go over $500 of non-cash contributions, um, in 82, 83, there's a form you're going to use. Um, you have to be a little bit more um, uh, detailed as to what you gave. Um, the other thing, too, is that is on this 82, 83 is if you contribute a car, okay? So you may have to make some a little bit more of a uh, detail about your deductions there, okay? All right. Okay. And I'm sorry, there's the 8283. Uh, if you give over that 500, again, talks about, you know, you can see there in the middle, talks about the VIN number. Um, you'll get a 1098C to send in with the contributions to that, um, um, for that vehicle, okay? Um, limits on deductions. Um, again, there's some thresholds with charitable deductions um, that you can be limited on that. Um, you know, so again, you know, if, if you have somebody that's making an excess of 313000 they may not get all those dollar-for-dollar dollar charitable organizations. Um, here's the uh, chart I was talking about with the uh, Goodwill uh, that they have out there. We actually, I print for my clients, and if I have somebody that is going to have this, I'll put it in their client folder for them with the return so that they have record of it. Um, best example, if I go to T-shirts, it says $1 to $6. Well, one dollar, it might be something you sell at the yard sale uh, that's going to turn into a, a, wag for, a, a, wag, a rag for somebody to wax their car, okay? Uh, Six dollars might be something that somebody is going to buy in a thrift shop because it really has some value. So again, you have to be legitimate about the value of these, okay? Uh, the one that comes in quite a bit for men, um, uh, you know, grandpa was 5'2", and 
and uh, nobody else in the family was that size. And a lot of these suits were almost brand new. You only wore them to church on Sunday. Still, there may only be a 10 to $30 value just because, you know, they're a suit that was never worn and, and has a great amount of sentimental value. Doesn't mean the fair market value or the thrift store pricing would match that value, okay? Um, one that I do tell everybody to keep an eye on, and sometimes people forget, is uh, contributions to nonprofits when you do electronic devices. Actually, those are pretty lucrative uh, uh, non-cash contributions because a lot of times those organizations are harvesting the gold, platinum, silver that are in those, and that's the way they make their money. So the contributions of old CPUs and, and uh, printers and stuff like that um, actually are a pretty good uh, uh, non-cash contribution. Um, you know, just make sure that, uh, you know, again, depends on the age of it, but uh, realize that they have those in there because they're harvesting those precious metals that are inside them, okay? All right, some exercises there on charitable. Again, we have a Schedule A and we've pretty much gotten through line 19. Um, as far as the Schedule A, and uh, you know, the next chapter we're going to talk about the uh, um, other cash, other excuse me, other side um, itemized deductions. We're going to get into some casualty and theft losses, uh, employee business, work related, in the two percent, non two percent. Okay, so what we're going to do right now is we're going to take about a five minute um, break. So everybody can stretch your legs, warm up the coffee if they need to. All right, and we will be back in about five minutes, go through the other and do some problems. And again, uh, here on the break, I'm gonna try to send out the answers. Let's see, I'll send them out through chapter nine. So I'll send out six through nine, and um, we'll go from there. Okay, so uh, on the break, I hope everybody's back. Um, on the break, I did uh, send out those uh, answers that uh, Pat had talked about. Um, I sent out through chapter nine, uh, the workbook answers. So those are there. Uh, just a reminder for everybody for the quizzes and uh, the exercises that in the back, um, I think on your thumb drive and on the back of the um, uh, volume two of the workbook is the uh, answers for all of those. So, you know, and I know on the thumb drive, uh, there is a answer key you know, that has all the exercise and quizzes and answers on it there. So, all right, so you have those, but uh, I did send out on the workbook. So um, if you guys want to take a look at any of those, um, when we're going to do problems, uh, we can talk about those. Um, I also sent out the written midterm. Um, no fair, just because you have it now that you can uh, that you're attending, that you can start to ask questions about anything that is on the written midterm. Uh, so um, it is an open book. You can use any resources. Um, I suppose that uh, after today's lecture, you can do phone a friend. Um, I will be your friend and answer questions for you if you would like. Um, so make sure that, uh, you know, that we do that, okay? Um, let's see here. Um, and I sent out, uh, I did not send out the computer, but as I talked about on the 24th, um, this year I do want everybody to do the midterm at the same time. Uh, last couple years, um, I've had sent it out for people to work on and it kind of, uh, dribbled and drabbed in. So I'm going to just uh, kind of on that Saturday, that's all we're going to do on the 24th is the computer midterm. Um, I will send it out uh, with the Zoom code um, that morning, um, kind of as a midpoint, mid checkpoint to have everybody get uh, that done. So um, how do you want the mid midterm and submitted? So you have mail? Computer. Um, if I could get the written midterm, uh, kind of like you've done the quizzes. Um, if you can just do it as the, uh, you can either scan it and send it to me as a PDF electronically, or uh, you can just type it in the body of an email uh, with the answers. Um, if you look at the midterm, it's um, a few fill in the blank, um, uh, some multiple choice, 
uh, some matching and some true false. So it's not too bad, okay? All right. All right, so we're gonna continue with our itemized deductions. Uh, moving down the um, Schedule A, okay? Um, so we're headed into part two of the itemized deductions, chapter 11, okay? And we have on that, uh, we're gonna talk about, let me get to our objectives here. We're gonna talk about uh, casualty and theft losses um, on those. Um, the net operating loss on the Form 1045, we're not really going to talk about that. Uh, basic tax returns, you really don't see anything with that. Uh, net operating losses, a lot of times with those, uh, those would be things that would come over on a K-1 um, or, you know, if they have, you have excessive um, um, losses due to your income, things like that. So it's very, very rare uh, because if those operating losses are um, exorbitant, if you will, then um, we probably have to scrutinize them a little bit more before we would say that it's a net operating loss that we're going to take and uh, uh, roll over, carry over to the next years. Um, we're going to talk a lot about uh, the employee business expenses, uh, that Form 2106, okay? So we're going to talk about that, things that are subject to 2% and things that are not subject to 2%, okay? So we're going to talk about those uh, and the limitation on itemized deductions. Okay, all right, casualty and theft losses. Um, sometimes you see a lot of these and sometimes you don't. Um, you know, it all depends on the circumstances. Uh, right now in this area, the best example or prime example of things that may be something to do with a uh, loss um, is uh, the uh, flooding and shoreline um, on Lake Ontario. Um, those are things uh, Esther's talked about. Uh, I think she did a blog on it uh, where she talked about those, uh, those losses there um, and, and how those are handled. Um, what it boils down to with casualty theft and losses is it, it is a pretty tough, uh, use the form 4684, it is a pretty tough one uh, to get to, um, to really uh, uh, be able to have it add, first you have to itemize, and then add to your itemized deductions because after any reimbursements for insurance, um, anything like that or anything that's lost um, that way, um, you can take it, but then it has to exceed 10% of your adjusted gross income. You know, so again, somebody makes $100,000, uh, we're talking about an AGI of $100,000, 10% of that AGI is $10,000. Well, you know, your deductible on something for insurance would have to be $10,000 or more for you to really have a, a, a good chance of, of using this, uh, this, this casualty or theft loss. So again, it's a tough one, okay? So, you know, we're gonna kind of go over pretty quick, um, you know, that, that, that we're gonna talk about uh, as far as it is. We don't see a lot of them. Um, like I said, it all depends. Um, you know, casualty, again, the best thing to realize is that it has to be an identifiable event that is sudden and unexpected. Um, things like car accidents, earthquakes, um, obviously, you know, uh, thoughts and prayers to those in California with the fires, uh, floods, um, you know, disasters, mine cave-ins, shipwrecks, sonic booms, uh, storms, including hurricanes and tornadoes, terrorist attacks, vandalism, uh, volcanic eruptions, I mean, you know, those are pretty identifiable and those are pretty sudden, okay? So those are things that we would have on those, okay? All right, uh, non-deductible, um, I guess my favorite that they put in here is that uh, it talks about, um, you know, uh, you know, if you got somebody in the house that's clumsy, that's breaking China, that's not, you know, something that you could do as a loss. Um, you know, and I guess here, if the family pet eats your couch, um, again, not something that, uh, that we can deduct as a loss, okay? And then the other thing too is uh, some of those things where it talks about um, the uh, uh, progressive deterioration. You know, if it's something that, you know, you are knowledgeable of and have a chance to prevent, then that would be something that uh, is not sudden and unexpected, 
okay? So you have to be very careful with that, all right? Uh, theft, um, this one, the biggest example, and it's right there underlined in the middle of the screen, is a Ponzi type investment scheme. Um, if somebody has their money taken in that manner. However, you have to be careful. Um, actually, about two weeks ago, uh, helped an individual that uh, was behind on their taxes. And one reason is uh, back in 2013, they had invested some money in some oil and gas in Kentucky and Tennessee. Um, they had invested this in a partnership uh, that they had been uh, uh, given the opportunity to purchase into. When they did this, um, they found out that it was a scheme. It was an investment scheme. It was not a Ponzi type scheme, but it was an investment scheme where there was actually no oil or gas rights involved. So the individual put this money in there and actually it went to court and it was not deemed a Ponzi scheme. So we had to take it as a capital loss. So even though they had invested $45,000 in this and the guy took it and was never to be found, um, but the criminal case to charge him with it and, and put out a warrant for him, you know, basically said that they had a capital loss because of their investment. So we can only take it 3000 a year. It was not a Ponzi type scheme where we could do this um, casually in theft loss. Okay. So again, you know, you just have to make sure on that with, you know, when you're talking about theft or loss of things like that. Uh, proof of loss. Again, I go back to the cell day and age of cell phones. Make sure that you're snapping pictures, um, things that you've you know lost. Um, I tell people too in situations like this, um, you know, it's not a bad idea to take a Saturday afternoon. Maybe you can do it after today's lecture. Uh, take a walk around the house, uh, snap some pictures of belongings. Um, you know, if you, you got that you know Babe Ruth rookie card sitting on your bookshelf. Make sure you snap a picture of it and put it somewhere safe or get it on a thumb drive that uh, you can put in a firebox or safety deposit box or something like that. Um, you have to have some records. Um, you know, just as when you make insurance claims, um, again, I go back to clients and I try to use stories like that to kind of get you a sense. I had somebody that uh, I was helping uh, with uh, them doing some uh, uh, loss because the insurance would not reimburse them for some things. Uh, this lady was actually lucky to be alive. Had a neighbor that uh, did not take care of a tree and it was on the neighbor's property. The tree actually fell through the house in the kitchen uh, while she was standing at the sink and fell right behind her. Uh, knocked her over. She did have some injuries, uh, but she could have been killed. But uh, there were some things that uh, because they really didn't have records of that were in the kitchen that were of value. Um, that uh, they they weren't able to do and we were able to pursue some things with some losses there for them some casualty losses but again you know if they would have had some pictures or more of a, a, a inventory or log if you will of what their belongings were so it's always a good idea to do that okay all right Let somebody in the chat give me one second here Okay. Uh, deductible from a car accident count is a casual loss? Yes. But again, when we talk about the deductible, like I said, you know, you have to have it exceed 10% of your adjusted gross income. Um, I hope nobody's driving around with a $10,000, you know, again, if somebody makes $100,000 or even $50,000 as their adjusted gross income, uh, $5,000 deductible. And again, it's one of those things that then we get to take the amount in excess of the 5,000. So if we have a $6,000 loss, we only get to count 1,000 towards our itemized, and then we have to itemize, so there's a couple thresholds. So the answer is yes, but it's a tough one with the car accidents, because again, you know, it's, it's tough when you have, uh, hopefully nobody has that bad of insurance that they have that high of a deductible, okay? Um, big thing, like, like I said, is, you know, you have to do a fair market value uh, for those things that are lost. Um, that's why I talk about the, uh, you know, pictures and the good inventory. Um, kind of goes back to our um, uh, talk of uh, adjusted basis uh, with property, okay? And again, I talked about the fact that uh, you must, uh, any uh, reimbursement that you had, 
um, you have to subtract that because it's it's kind of a cash basis. You know, if I have a loss, but I am reimbursed, um, you know, inventory, again, I go back to sometimes when you see something happen with an insurance company, they will give you what they can term, term uh, what you've identified, and they'll give you fair market value of that uh, based on some tables that they may have and the adjusters out. And, um, you know, I go back October storm. Uh, you hear about a lot of people that lost awnings, porches, furniture, stuff like that. I'm sure all the insurance adjusters had uh, very accurate charts that uh, were able to give fair market value to all those things and, and uh, determine it. But, you know, that if they were reimbursed for that, then again, it's not a loss because you were paid for it. Okay. All right. Um, as I talked about it, you know, there's that 10% rule. There's even a $100 rule, but a 10% rule. And then, you know, it has to be subject to uh, uh, a good portion of your income. Um, and then go above that in order for you to actually take it, okay? Uh, you're going to do a little exercise with the 4684 to kind of see how that calculation goes and how it flows over. Uh, there's a little example here where it talks about a car accident uh, for uh, Tony that asked the question there. Uh, so it kind of goes through that and, and uh, how that works. You know, when it's all said and done, you know, again, it's a situation where, you know, situation has to be such that we we can get to the threshold to take the uh, casualty and theft loss and equally we have to be able to itemize okay all right okay again a few up, up um, exercises there about the uh, loss uh, again net operating loss i'm just going to let you have that there for you to read it um, you just don't see enough of it to really spend any time on it Okay, all right, all right, employed business expenses. We have uh, business expenses um, that we have that when you are a W-2 employee uh, that you can deduct on your itemized deductions, okay? Um, that is for 2017. Uh, 2018, these are disappearing. Okay, so they're no longer going to be deductible in 2018 on your Schedule A. So again, um, employee business expenses, if right there in your workbook or however you're taking notes, you want to say yes, 2017, 2018 tax return, no, you cannot take them. Okay, so anything in this area with these 2% uh, job related, okay? Um, as far as job and business expenses, we're going to talk about things that are ordinary and necessary for travel, entertainment, gifts, and transportation. Okay, uh, We talk about ordinary expenses that is common and accepted in a trade or business, and necessary is one that is helpful and appropriate for that business. Okay, And again, it notes there that they must be unreimbursed expenses. Okay. Again, I use New York State as an example. I have an individual that I'm helping with um, on something of an audit from New York State. Uh, we had record of all of their mileage uh, that they did outside of their normal commute for an employer. Uh, business mileage that they were not reimbursed for. Uh, we had a log, we provided everything we needed to that, uh, that it states. Uh, when we provided that again to New York State, they came back to us and says, fine. But in order to prove it, we need a letter from the employer stating that this is what they ask you to do. So now we have to turn around and go back to the employer and ask them that we have to state that, yes, one of your employees is going through an audit for the miles that they claimed and have them validated. So obviously, it's just New York State asking us to jump through hoops, okay? Um, we're going to talk about the 2106. There's a regular and an easy form. Um, again, and this is where it exceeds 2% of their AGI, okay? And this is a tough one. You know, this is areas where we're going to see union dues and different expenses that somebody has. But again, you know, if their income is higher uh, than that 2%, that's a tough threshold for us to overcome. All right. Uh, travel expenses may be deductible when the, the employee is traveling away from their tax home uh, for their profession or job, Okay. Uh, generally, their tax home is, um, you know, where they, you know, work or, you know, where they live and work, okay? Um, and it may also be for sleep or rest. Now, 
the one thing is about this is that, you know, we bring into play here, and this is a good time to talk about it, is when we have somebody that is away overnight and, uh, and or best example is a over-the-road trucker, they would get a per diem. Uh, that per diem is basically meals and incidental uh, such. And, you know, based on somebody, and I have my over-road truckers come in with their logs and, you know, out of 365 days, they were out 210 or whatever. And we kind of pick apart, you know, where they drove, states, areas, because each one of them has a different per diem. So we keep track of that, okay? And uh, so they are allowed to take the meals and incidental, especially for an over the road. Um, it kind of gives them, you know, a reimbursement, um, what somebody might normally take for lodging in a hotel because they're sleeping in the back of their truck, okay? Um, talks about the difference between a temporary and an indefinite assignment. Uh, make sure that you understand those. A uh, good example on those, again, I think I've used it before, is road crews, uh, where you know somebody that works for a road crew goes out and they may be on a construction job for a year or more. It always seems like road construction takes at least a year, but uh, going out for road construction for a year or more, um, you know, that's kind of an indefinite job assignment. Okay. Uh, meals, whether you believe it or not, um, the, um, you, the IRS has said that you must eat, okay? So for all your meals that you're eating while you're working, those are not deductible, okay? You can take 50% of unreimbursed meals if it is for a business uh, meeting, okay? So again, the IRS has deemed that you must, must eat, okay? So they're not going to allow you to write off your drive-through of Tim Hortons every morning. Um, so, but you know, if you go to Tim Hortons and you meet with a client, you're a W-2 employee. You know, that's something that could be subject to being 50% being written off. If you're going to Tim Hortons with your laptop to do some work, that is not a meal that you're going to be able to deduct. Okay, so just make sure that we understand that. All right. Just waiting for the chat to come up. Give me a second here. Uh, Tony brought up a good point. Um, when somebody is um, prison guards, uh, for somewhere along the line in New York State, uh, prison guards have been told that they are assigned to a prison, and when they're reassigned for a temporary basis, that their commute and everything else is deductible. Um, I am typically not in agreement there because, you know, any other profession, if you are transferred from one office to another office, that just means that your commute has changed, okay? So I typically, Tony, I do not give in to that belief that somebody is being, um, you know, when they're reassigned temporarily to another prison, um, that they're able to write off all that mileage and all those expenses and things like that. Um, you know, you have to be very careful and see what they're doing with that. Um, you know, that's another thing that sometimes we will get into, not as much so, but I used to see a lot of clients that all the military that I did um, when they're, you know, living in Buffalo, but uh, their station of duty is, uh, you know, Albany, and they have an apartment there and things like that, you just, you know, you're stretching it, uh, just because, you know, it's not really something that uh, would be deemed that is a um, uh, job expense, per se, okay? Uh, lodging, uh, we talked about a little bit there. Uh, here's a good list of travel expenses you can deduct. Um, you know, if you're taking off uh, your transportation, you know, you have a taxi while you're away, uh, lodging and meals, um, you know, you're living somewhere where, um, you know, for on your assignment that you have to be able to do lodging and meals and such um, and, and dry cleaning your suit or whatever it may be. Um, you know, those are other things. Uh, telephone, that's when you don't see much anymore. Somebody's uh, working for a W-2 company. Um, one of their benefits may be that they're given a cell phone with unlimited or whatever. Um, so that, you know, again, anything that is not reimbursed, okay? Uh, entertainment expenses, 
Again, directly related and associated. The biggest thing with entertainment expenses is it somewhere that it is ordinary and necessary and it is something where business can be done, okay? Um, only 50% on reimbursement uh, entertainment expenses is deductible. Um, I guess the best example right there in the middle, it says the following trips do not meet the direct related test. Fishing, hunting, yachts, and other pleasure boats as business is not considered the main purpose. I mean, I realize just like golf that when you're out there fishing, um, you know, swinging the golf club and catching the fish are not really most of the time that you're there. You're just sitting there or driving around the golf course or you're outside or whatever for the hours that you're partaking. But again, because you know the, the main purpose of those two is not to conduct business, um, you know that, that's where they really limit that, okay? And again, it's a 50%, all right? Um, let's see here. Um, gift expenses um, is another one with uh, job expenses. If you've ever wondered why you always get a $25 gift card, uh, to Tim Hortons as a business related gift. That's because that individual can only write $25 off. They're not going to give you a $30 gift card and then only write off a $25 expense. Okay. So that's why, you know, you, you, I guess Tim Hortons is why they sell $25 gift cards all the time. Okay. Uh, we talked about transportation expenses. Again, you know, getting from one place to the other. Um, this little chart right here, I call it my Monopoly chart. Um, I think it's a great chart. Uh, I think it looks like the little Monopoly things, the black parts. But this is basically for you to determine are those mileage, or excuse me, is that mileage deductible, okay? So we gotta start out at home, and where are we going? Well, if we're going back and forth to our regular job where the desk is there on the picture, that's never deductible, that's a commute, okay? Now, if I go to my regular job, and then from there, I work a second job. Um, spe speaking of uh, um, prison guards, I used to have somebody that worked for me that uh, in the office that was a prison guard. She would go to her job, and then from there, she would come to EG Tax at night and work for me and do tax returns. Um, obviously, I knew this because she came in dressed as a prison guard, um, and it was not Halloween. She would change clothes and then work for me. That mileage from her first job, the prison, to EG Tax Office was deductible. Now, when she went from her job at EG Tax home, not deductible, okay? So you have to understand that, all right? Another example, we talked about temporary work location. So if somebody goes to an office, say they're a plumber, and they have a main corporate office and they go to that, well, from that, their job and assignment, they go to temporary work locations and they are using their vehicle that they are not reimbursed for to that temporary location, that would be deductible, okay? So make sure that you understand which, you know, and following the little arrows in the flow charts, you know, because then they're gonna go from the place they worked back to the office to complete the day or turn in their billing and then go home. Well, just that trip back and forth to that temporary work location is deductible but not going back and forth to home, okay? So make sure that you, again, you know, this is one of those great little charts that the IRS has to really have you be able to visually explain, okay? Uh, 17, we're gonna get 53 and a half cents per mile. For 18, 54 and a half cents per mile, okay? And again, this is the big one, um, you know, and, and I talk about the fact with the difference from 17 to 18, this is the one that Esther talks about that makes absolutely no sense is these business expenses um, against the actual expenses um, for things in the, um, for W-2 employee. Um, it doesn't seem fair that because somebody's paid on a W-2 and somebody is paid on um, a 1099 where they'd be self-employed, that if it's the same job, just because of the method that they're paid, that they don't get to deduct certain expenses. Now, obviously, the 1099 has a lot more opportunity, but they're also subject to self-employment tax and the uh, income tax on there. But the W-2 is subject to that income tax. So for two different, you know, 
two different payment methods to not be able to deduct that, that's tough. That is really tough, okay? Um, but that's what 18 has on there. Uh, record keeping, again, I cannot stress enough. Um, I guess as a commercial plug uh, right now um, for everybody, and if you haven't downloaded it, you should. Um, it's on our website, right in the middle of the front website, but EG Tax has an app, and that app is outstanding for the self-employed. Um, I tell my clients about it all the time. Um, they can go in there and download it, and when you have that app there, it's a great little screen. Hope everybody can see that there. Um, has a little picture of the Buffalo skyline behind it, but on there, there is a receipt manager and a mileage tracker, okay? Uh, the receipt manager, you can take pictures of receipts, log them, and put them into a spreadsheet. So obviously you've done your record keeping. Uh, for the mileage tracker, for those of you that need to track mileage, uh, once you have a, a location uh, set up on your smartphone uh, that you allow it to know where you're at, as soon as that phone is in your car and you're in motion, it turns on and keeps track of the miles that you're driving, it turns off when you've reached your destination, uh, will pop up and ask you, is this a business trip? And you can say yes or no, and just log those trips that you make. Um, I use it all the time for my self-employed. I use it for my landlords, that their job is uh, basically to take care of uh, properties so that they are tracking their miles, traveling around their properties, and that is their business, okay? All right, but, uh, you know, again, a little commercial plug there for the EG Tax app, okay? Um, again, I cannot stress um, that you a uh, you know W-2 employee can deduct uh, the, those expenses that are not reimbursed. If you have reimbursements, you know that's going to be a different ballgame. Um, good example is sometimes people. Uh, my wife used to have an employer that they paid 21 cents a mile to her on her W-2. Well, that means the remainder could be on the, um, in 2017, could be deductible. So the remainder of the mileage rate that she did not get reimbursed for is something that would be something that she could take. So in 2017, that difference between 21 and the 53, you know, that 32 cents, that's where we could deduct that. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, um, this little thing has some other things that we talk about that we may not put on the 2106, but there are things that can be uh, deducted as uh, uh, unreimbursed employment related expenses. Um, huge ones, union dues, okay? And a lot of times I will have people come in to me and I'm sure you understand why I'm making this statement, uh, but they said, well, the union told me that my union dues were 2% of my adjusted gross income plus X number of dollars, okay? Obviously, the reason they're saying that is they understand that in order for the union dues to fully count, it has to exceed 2% of the adjusted gross income, okay? Uh, mechanics that are W-2s, maybe they have to provide their own tools. You know, Snap-on, Mac, all those trucks you see driving around, you know, delivering tools, they have a great little report that they print out for everybody and what they paid for and what they bought for the year for tools, so those are great ones, okay? Um, subscriptions to professional magazines. Um, using our prison guard example, if somebody has uh, a subscription to some type of uh, periodical that has to do with their um, profession, that's great. If it's a prison guard and, uh, you know, that uh, the gardening of roses, I don't imagine, well, I guess you could if they're teaching that to the inmates, but I, I would guess that that would be a stretch that uh, having a magazine or periodical about roses, if you're a prison guard, probably wouldn't be a professional organization, a professional magazine, excuse me, okay? All right. Uh, police and security want to deduct everything, guns, ammo, memberships to gun range, uniforms, etc. Again, you have to be careful with that, okay? Um, you know, if that is a weapon that they have to have for their job, that they're not provided by the job, and they have to take care of it, uh, certification, things like that, and they are not reimbursed for that, that is one thing. But if that is a weapon, and just because they're a police officer, they have a gun at home,
but they're not required to, then you're, you're kind of getting a little bit of a gray area. Again, these are things that are ordinary and necessary, okay? Like I said, if they're not provided a weapon and they have to purchase one and it's not something they're reimbursed for, yeah, that could be the typical. Um, you know, so you have to just really ask the questions on the due diligence and say, well, yes, or if they have to have certification to remain, you know, licensed or whatever with their firearm and they're not reimbursed for this, you know, but a lot of times when you're talking about a profession where they have to have something to do their job, reimbursement is there. And so the, the question of even whether it can go on there is, is not, okay? And again, these are 17 and, and prior, 18 and going forward as it stands right now, they're not deductible, okay? Um, talks about some of the other things with business. Uh, one that I use and we'll talk about uh, with adjustments to income is teachers. I have a, a young lady that is a drama music teacher in a school district that uh, is smaller and doesn't have a budget for musicals. Um, a lot of times she pays for uh, costumes and uh, sets out of her pocket. Uh, that being said, she does not get the opportunity to have that reimbursed by the school district because they don't have the budget. So. Those are things that she can write off over and above her stipend that she gets from the federal of $250 on the adjustments to income, okay? So those are things that would play into that, okay? Uh, uniforms, this is one that gets a little tricky. Um, you know, it must be a condition of employment and not suitable for everyday wear. Um, I guess the one that I get into a little bit that uh, I, I have to press for is, is uh, scrubs. Uh, some people, you know, that work in nursing homes or, or you know, non-sterile, I guess, medical settings, they have scrubs, but those sometimes appear to be also suitable for everyday wear because even on the days they work, they're still not working. I should say they're wearing their scrubs. Um, so, again, you have to be very careful. You know, things like safety boots, safety glasses. Um, again, I kind of go back and forth sometimes with people with the whole safety uh, reflective jackets or the green t-shirts or whatever for safety. Um, again, you know, you have to be, are they required for work and things like that? You know, you got to do due diligence. And again, I'm not doubting people, but just knowing the way an auditor would ask the question, you know, somebody comes in for an audit, took a day off and they're wearing their reflective jacket and that's the only jacket they have, well, must be suitable for everyday wear. And they may ask that question. Okay. Uh, mileage, again, the thing with mileage is we have two ways to treat it. Uh, we can treat the mileage or we can do actual. So you can either take the mileage rate, uh, in this case in 17, we're talking about 53 and a half cents, or you can take the actual, which would be every gallon of gas, every oil change, every tire, every repair. Um, I would guess 95, 97, I don't know, 99% of the time, the mileage rate is far better than the actual, okay? Um, even when you add together your insurance and everything like that, you know, if you're traveling a lot of miles and you're getting reimbursed at 53 and a half cents a mile, it's probably going to be a lot greater and a better deduction against your uh, income um, using that mileage rate than it is to just take the, um, the um, uh, actual expenses, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about the 2106 when we get into the um, um, actual uh, problems. Uh, Work-related education, um, you know, again, these are education that must meet two tests. It is required by the employer or the law to keep the taxpayer's present salary status or position, um, and the education maintains or improves skills needed in the taxpayer's present work, okay? Uh, best way to describe this, whoops, is the examples at the bottom of 1134. Uh, we have Jill, a teacher. She's satisfied the minimum requirements for teaching. However, her employer requires an additional course each year to keep teach her teaching job. Um, if the course will not qualify for a new trade or business, they are qualifying work-related education, even if Jill eventually receives a master's degree and an increase in salary. So basically, it is a condition of her employment. Okay. Next example is Kelly. She's a sales clerk at a local store. She's decided to take a tax class similar to the one that you're in um, with the hopes of becoming a tax professional. Because this work would qualify her in a new business, the cost of the course is not deductible, 
okay? Dorothy, a tax professional, attended a week of seminars dealing with corporate taxes to improve her job skills. The cost of the seminars, deductible. Okay, so you can see how that ordinary necessary or that, that test can be coming in as far as how those uh, expenses, okay? All right, okay. Um, I guess, and nobody's typed it in the chat yet, maybe somebody is asking about the cost of this tax class. Is it deductible? Well, it depends. You know, if it's something where you're getting a new profession, no. Um, if it's type of thing where you're uh, bettering your skills or certification as a tax professional, yes, okay? So you gotta be careful, all right? Uh, tax prep expenses, uh, tax fees paid. Again, this is in that section. We can see the little cutout here of the section that we're talking about, but uh, as long as it exceeds 2%, um, you can count the tax prep fees. Um, I'm pretty proud to say with EG Tax that our tax um, prep fees are such that you're probably not gonna get above the uh, 2%, okay? All right, so we have that. Um, again, so these are some other expenses that are subject to the 2%. Um, you know, when we get, again, um, legal fees and expenses, a lot of times the people try to put that in. Make sure you understand that uh, in order to deduct legal expenses, they must be incurred in attempting to produce or collect income or a tax refund. Okay. All right. Uh, Non-deductible expenses, again, some very good ones here that we can talk about. Um, you know, the things that you cannot deduct on there. Again, I talk about the, the legal expenses. If you look at the little example down there, uh, $4,000 for her lawyer for representation during the divorce, uh, $450 to prepare a new will and take the ex-husband out, and $2,500 in getting the alimony. Only that $2,500 is deductible, okay? All right, okay, and limit on itemized deductions. Again, you know, just like a lot of things that are on there as your income increases, some of these things that you're able to use or, or take advantage of that uh, would deduct your taxable income sometimes have phase out or limitations. So again, you know, we talked earlier about mortgage insurance premiums, but you can see as a whole, for itemized deductions, when their income goes above these thresholds, that's where the phase out or limitation on what they can take on their itemized deductions uh, to be able to deduct. And again, we have some things that are and aren't limited uh, by that income level. Okay. All right. Okay, so that gets us through chapter 11. Okay, so we've done 1011 on our itemized deductions. And I think what we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna do one problem here. Uh, let's see, which one did I have us doing? Okay, so let's see here. <clears throat> okay. All right, so I think what we're going to do is uh, we'll just do the one problem today. We're going to do uh, problem 11-1, okay? So we're just going to take a couple minutes while I get this set up. Uh, so we'll take a short break and then uh, be All right. So we are back. Um, like I said, we're just going to do one problem here. I have one that I'm going to do out of, uh, just because I like the name. It's Timothy, and, uh, and it's on page 11.4 um, in your workbook. Um, 
Uh, Timothy is a security guard, and uh, we have his problem there, and it talks about, it's got some bullet points. Um, he has some expenses, uh, or is itemized. He has some W-2 income and things that come from his, um, his job and his mortgage and such. So we're going to go ahead and we'll do those, and we're going to do that problem there, okay? So we'll do that one because it kind of hits a lot of the things that uh, we talk about. All right, so we're going to go through the bullet points real quick. Uh, Timothy filed a 1040 last year, so that means there may be an instance for itemized. Um, Timothy is divorced and his ex-wife uh, itemized last year. They received a $2 federal refund. Uh, Timothy and his wife went through a divorce that was finalized in December. Uh, again, one of those little bullet points that has some fluff to it because they received a $2 federal refund. Uh, again, not a state refund that we might declare on line 10 of the 1040 for income, okay? Uh, we have that uh, they would like to handle, or he, I'm sorry, would like to handle any refund or amount owed electronically. Um, we're gonna use the little sheet that we have for his return. Um, he won $500 from a scratch off ticket. Um, he had health insurance the all year, and then we can see there below that he had some um, expenses that he would like to put on his itemized, okay? So we're going to go through this problem. Uh, so we'll get in. We'll start a new return. Um, let me get him set up. All right, so we'll go through Timothy's here, and I'm changing a little bit of the social. Uh, as far as what we had on there, um, because um, don't want the problem to pop up where I have done it previously. Okay. All right, give me one second here. Okay. All right. So we have. Okay, so we are in this, and uh, again, we have Timothy, and he has middle initial, and I'm not sure, uh, Siemens, I'm not sure how is pronounced of his last name. Okay, and we have his address here as 23, and it is Treadwell Drive. Okay. All right. And we have his email. And we have a phone number for him. And we have his cell phone number also. All right, and we have his date of birth. And again, always making sure that you're doing this stuff um, to get this in because it is very important that we get this in accurately. Uh, reason being is that uh, if we have anything that has to do with uh, a um, retirement account, we wanna make sure that birth date is in there. You know, in this case, he's 51, so if he's taking a disbursement from a retirement account, um, he is single. Um, the divorce was finalized in December, so it divorced one day, divorced the whole year, just like married one day, married the whole year, okay? Uh, no dependents to claim on the return. Um, he lived in New York the entire year. We're going to e-file. He does have a... Um, he does have a um, bank account that he would like us to use. Uh, PIN number, again, I'm just going to use his um, 
uh, zip code. We must live just down the street here to our new corporate office in Tonawanda. Okay. Uh, we're just going to skip over the license and know that uh, we use something other than his driver's license to validate his identity. Okay. All right, so we're getting all the stuff here. All right, we get everything filled in as far as the uh, information here. Okay. All right, talked about the fact that uh, they did itemize last year. So our 1040 page one, that midway down box, they did itemize, but uh, they didn't talk about a state refund. They just talk about a federal. So we're gonna have three to get rid of that, okay? And it does state um, that they had, um, that uh, he had health insurance the entire year, okay? All right. Uh, so we have everything there. First thing I'm going to put in, uh, as far as cleanup, I'm going to get his W-2 in there. Uh, he worked, uh, as we said, he's a security guard. Uh, make sure you check. Uh, check his address to make sure it matches what's on the W-2. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get his EIN number in there. Uh, again, he works for bank security systems. Uh, we have his... Uh, Taxable income in box one. We had that he had some withholding. Okay. Um, nothing in box 12, but we do have in box 14, we have the United Way, and he gave $532.81. Uh, we're going to want to remember that. Uh, remember, I've told you from box 14 in the software that it does not flow to anything else. If that was something that went in box one, it would be different, uh, but in box two, it does not work that way. We have our um, New York withholding. Okay, so we have that. So we have everything there. Um, if you take a chance before we do anything else and you notice, because um, he just has the two tax documents on 11.6, but if you take a look up in the blue box, the refund monitor in the top left corner, as it stands right now, he's just not doing enough withholding. He owes money. But we're going to see what we can do with his itemized deductions. Okay? So now we're going to kind of go to his uh, sheet on 11.4, and we're going to talk about, and we'll kind of talk a little bit more about some of the things, but we're going to talk about uh, the things that would be on the itemized. Okay? So we're going to talk about cash donations to the church. So we're going to our Schedule A. And when we go in there, first thing is I'm going to clean it up. Remember I mentioned something about general sales tax. So if I go into the general sales tax and I hit F9, I'm going to have here, and I'll highlight it, a little sales tax worksheet uh, that we have and go into that. We'll do the sales tax worksheet on that. Uh, this pops up. We talked about it in the textbook uh, that we have it in there. So in this case, they're a New York resident. Okay, and again, you know, for those of you in Florida, uh, you want to go in the workbook, take a look at this, uh, because obviously there's no state income tax, so this is something the general sales tax calculation is going to be very important. Okay, so we go into this, um, and it goes in here, and it already knows that we live in New York. Okay, ask for that letter. Remember I said to remember that uh, us in Erie, Niagara County, that's a B. Uh, from our table, gives us a little bit of a local sales tax from the table, okay? Um, then it asks, does your locality impose a local general sales tax? Of course, New York, we sales tax everything. So we hit yes, and we do the local, 4.75, okay? That is the local sales tax rate, not the state set sales tax. So we have that uh, based on our income there. We have some calculations. So according to this, and using the sales tax chart, 
$799, okay? Now, here's where I was talking about the general sales tax on specific items. Uh, motor vehicles, um, aircraft, boats, homes, including mobile and prefabricated, home building material, um, sales tax that we spend on this. This is where a lot of times we'll have people ask us about capital improvements, can I write them off? Well, you can write off the sales tax, but if you have a good contractor, those supplies for capital improvements in New York State, they're gonna have you fill out a form that you're not gonna to have to pay sales tax on it anyway, okay? So, the things that we would fall in there, and like I said, most often, it is something that has to do with a, um, a major motor vehicle purchase, okay? So that's where the sales tax comes in there. Now, it's a tough one. Okay, if I take and we get to deduct and I go back to my Schedule A after doing this and I look at the two here, I would have to have income tax 1238, okay, that I would have to exceed that with my general sales tax. And when I take and I divide that by the percentage, okay, that we can use, if it's a motor vehicle, I would have had to purchase a car that would have had to have at least about a $26,000 price tag in order for it to help me. So this is an instance, like I said, where it might be a good opportunity to take a look and see if the sales tax is going to help them. Now, on the flip side, if you have somebody that is retired and has no state tax or somebody in Florida, these are great things to do. This is general sales tax, okay? All right, so we're on our Schedule A. We're gonna go down here a little farther, and the first bullet point, uh, first thing that he had receipts for was a donation to his church. Well, here's our charities, and we could put it directly in, but our software has a great little worksheet that we're gonna use, and we're gonna go to that detail worksheet, and up in the top, um, we're gonna see this is where the medical expenses would go in, okay? So if we had medical expenses for him, which we do not, um, say that I guess that he shot himself in the foot and was not reimbursed for it as a security guard. Um, I guess that would be, what is it, uh, Mayberry Barty Fife, uh, where he has his one bullet in his pocket and he shot himself in the foot and he's not reimbursed by the employer, that would go in here, okay? But we have our medical miles. Again, here's insurance premiums, not pre-tax. Again, these are ones that are premiums that are paid. Uh, you can see over here, I talked about the Medicare that flows over, uh, but the qualified long-term medical expenses, that's all the places that the, the expenses would go here. And you can be as descript and as, as uh, minimal as you want. Um, you know, so you make sure that you have on those, okay? Um, one thing I'm gonna inject here about medical expenses, if somebody has some cost uh, for somebody in a nursing home, uh, room and board does not, but if there is cost for medical care while they're in the nursing home, that can go on itemized deductions. Now, equally, there's a great credit on the New York side. It's basically a bed tax, but it is a tax of about 6% that is charged for people in a nursing home that is fully refundable. So if you have somebody that you are a cash customer, if you will, and they're paying this tax um, to be in the uh, nursing home, um, I've had clients where I've had five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000 of um, this refundable credit on this, okay? So that's where we can have that and, and kind of have it uh, come in with that, okay? But in this case, we can put those nursing home expenses on there. This one, we have a cash donation to the church. So we're going to put the church in and we're going to have $260 there, okay? Now, I wanted you to remember, because it did not flow over, and this is where it would have gone, but on the W-2 for Timothy, we had the United Way that he contributes to out of his payroll, okay? So the United Way, we can put that in there. All right. Um, we had a few things here with work uniforms, union dues, professional publications. Uh, we're gonna come back to those in a second. We also had some things for uh, training for him, okay? Uh, but we didn't have anything else on there. Um, if he had made some contributions to the Goodwill, um, things like that with different contributions to that, this is where it would go to other cash contributions down here below. Um, like I said, the 8283 is there. 
Um, if you go into the box there and hit F9, you're going to see the, oops, the 8283 there, um, just like you saw in the workbook, uh, so that you have that. Um, again, very descriptive on this. Um, if I have something where he did to the goodwill, um, you know, I would typically on this one, I would type in the goodwill if they gave extra. Um, over here, I might type in the description of uh, um, household items and clothing. Okay. All right. Uh, down below, I might put in the date of the donation that he did. Uh, I gave it to uh, out a year ago today. Um, how acquired, you know, don't, um, um, or date acquired, I'm sorry. A lot of times they don't know that, so you don't have to worry about that. You can put in purchased here. Uh, donor's basis, you know, maybe he spent a thousand dollars and fair market was 250. And over here for the method, uh, a lot of times you can just put in thrift store pricing, okay? Uh, that kind of is way that 8283 would work, okay? But in this case, we did not need one. We're going to go back to Schedule A then. Uh, we talked about the fact that he had the charitable, okay? All right. Uh, down below here is where we're going to kind of get into, well, let's go over, I'm sorry, let's go over and do his 11.6 first. Our page 11.6, let's do his 1098. Uh, on his 1098, he had mortgage interest and uh, points at 69.84, and down there in box 11, it says taxes or other. So we're going to put his real estate taxes on his principal residence, 29.45. Um, we're going to have his home mortgage interest is here. Um, it's 69.84. Okay, so we have those in. Um, again, this is where the mortgage insurance premiums, you can see the line 13 here would go in. It goes into the left because it may be limited to based on the income. All right, and now we have this job related expenses, okay? You can see here we have a line on 21 for the 2106. And then we have a line here that you could just put them directly in. Um, in this case, we're gonna do a 2106 uh, for him um, because he has some mileage and such. If it was just union dues or something, we could go in here, hit F9, go to the Schedule A line 21, uh, the only option that we have there, and we could list these out. So for right now, I'm gonna put in there union dues, okay? So we have the union dues, and that's 328, okay? All right, so we have that. On my tree on the left, again, I'm gonna go back to my Schedule A, okay? And this time for things, uh, for other stuff that he has, I'm gonna do a 2106, because I wanna show you how this works. So we're gonna go into this line here. Again, you can see the box that I lit up on line 21. I'm gonna hit F9. I'm gonna go into my 2106 for my W-2 employees. And again, um, this is W-2. If somebody is a W-2 employee and they're statutory employee, they would put this on a Schedule C. But up here for this, I'm gonna put a description that he is a security guard. Again, you know, kind of a definition as to why we're taking the things. Uh, mileage, I'm gonna skip for right now. Parking, travel, because we're gonna talk about that a little bit later and some things he did for training. But the number four is kind of a miscellaneous business expenses that aren't in the things that have to do with his travel, okay? So, and then also, this is where we could get a uh, worksheet for his home office. Uh, it doesn't discuss it here, but if you want to take a look at it, uh, again, that's one of the spaces that you could put in there. I'm going to go in here, and this is the first time I'm probably going to introduce this, but it's an F9, and we're going to do the scratch pad, okay? It's kind of a little notepad that we have here for us to put information on. In this case, we have his work uniforms, okay, that we're going to deduct, okay. Um, the other things that he had there were his professional, uh, professional publications. Um, again, you know, if it's something on roses for a security guard, I imagine that doesn't apply. But in this case, we're probably looking at something that is much more of, uh, you know, body armor, digest, I don't know, whatever security guard was subscribed to. Okay, so we have that. Um, 
And we have, let's see here, uh, we had some training that he went to, okay? And that's kind of the next thing we're going to take in here. So we had his training, all right? And we had on that, we had um, $400 for his training, all right? So those are things that we might list in something like this, okay? Now, we're going to go back to the 2106 page one on our tree. And next thing we're going to kind of address is these first three lines. All right. So we have, we have, um, you know, our vehicle expenses. What we're going to do with this, uh, as it says here, it's from line 22 or 29. So I'm going to go actually to the 20, 2106 page two to line, uh, you can see 22 is here, it's calculated. Okay. And I'm going to put that vehicle and it talks about a vehicle here that he put in service on March 25th of 2009. All right, we have that. Um, I have total mileage, I'm just going to use 12,000, typical for a uh, lease as far as somebody having a car. In this case for training for business purposes, he drove 260 miles. Uh, you can see on line 22 that it calculated for us $139 at uh, 53 and a half cents. Um, it was his personal car, so he can use it for off duty. Um, he doesn't have another car. Again, the spouse thing is out because he is divorced. Uh, he had evidence because he said he has receipts, and that is the written evidence on that. Okay. So we have that. Uh, we're going to go back to the 2106 page one. Okay. And we're going to get to that. And the next line down in part two talks about uh, tolls, parking, things like that. And you can see there that he had $30 uh, between the um, parking and tolls for his training. So we're going to put that $30, oops, $30 in there. And then the last line is overnight lodging while he was away for training. We have the $280 on that. Okay. So we have those in there. All right. Okay, um, so we pretty much have everything off there as far as his work. Uh, going back to the Schedule A, um, we're going to have it such that down here we can see where everything's flowed over for us, the union dues, uh, the job expenses on the 2106. Uh, next couple of things that he had, and you can see the descriptions here, uh, but he had a safety deposit box, but prior to that on 22, he had tax prep, $152. Um, going down the line 23, we're going to hit F9 uh, to bring up the line description. We're going to have that there. It's going to give us kind of something similar to our scratch pad. Uh, but on that, we're going to put in the description of the safe uh, deposit box. Okay, in this case, he paid $50 for that. All right, so we had that, and I think we have everything off there. Uh, the one thing that's on there is legal fees for his divorce. Um, again, does not generate income, so we do not get to count that. Um, so no legal fees for his divorce, okay? Um, so we have um, everything on that. Now, the only thing really left is the gambling losses, and he also in the bullet point had some winnings. So we're going to go address the winnings first. Um, so we're going to go to uh, 1040 page one, go down to line 21, and we're going to go in there and get our worksheet for that line. Um, if we remember from our unearned income chapter, uh, this is where we might have a W2G, but in this case, he's just being an honest soul and he's telling us that he has one. So we're going to go to line 17, and we're going to put in there that he had gambling winnings, okay? And in the bullet point, he had $500, okay? And then also on there, it says he had losses of 720 Well, that's on a Schedule A, and that's going to be in that section down at the bottom that is not subject to 2%. So if we go to our other miscellaneous deductions on line 28, again, I'm on the Schedule A and we go in there and hit F9, we can see in there that there is a new other deductions line. Again, very similar to what we saw with our scratch pad. Uh, it's gonna be just kind of a thing for multiple lines. And we're gonna put in there gambling losses. 
but we have to remember our rules so we cannot take more in losses than we had in winnings so we can only put five hundred dollars in there okay so gambling losses even though he lost seven hundred and twenty dollars we can only put in there that he had uh, winnings of um, or losses, excuse me, of five hundred dollars. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So we have everything there. Okay. All right. So we have everything on the ten forty. We have everything, I believe, on the schedule A. We have our property taxes. Everything there. We have all the different things. You can see on the section lines 21 through 27, this is where it's subject to the 2%. Even though he may have had $1,593 in expenses, um, the 2%, you know, of his adjusted gross income, you know, he's only to take allowed to take 808, and then he has his $50 in um, um, in the or excuse me, $500 in gambling losses, okay? So we have everything there, okay? All right, so that's what we have on this one. Is there any questions? I uh, know we kind of hit a lot of things from chapter 10 and 11 in this one. Uh, try to talk about some of the specifics on the different things there, okay? Again, take your mic off, or if you'd like to go on to the All right. Okay. And one second here. Just waiting for the chat to come up, so give me one moment. this morning okay what is TSJ okay TSJ if uh, it shows up a lot in there um, everybody always thought that was the the disorder for your jaw but it is not okay that's TMJ TSA stands for taxpayer spouse and joint um, it's something that shows up as a column on a lot of the forms um, obviously, at the top of our W-2s and 1099s, we have taxpayer and spouse uh, and joint. But if it's a case that somebody's going through a divorce or a separation, um, this is a great one to, to really um, use because on investments, um, deductions, anything like that, so that uh, when they go to contest the divorce, I guess, if you lack for better terms, uh, that you know exactly whose is whose on the tax return to make it clear. Okay, so that would be something that you would have on that. All right, any other questions? All right, page one of the 1040 form does not print for me. Okay, I'm not sure on that one. We might have to talk about that one another time when I have the IT guy available, Tony. Um, not sure why it's not printing to the PDF. Um, you know, I'm not sure, I, I'd have to do, and it's blank. Okay. Yeah, and that's something I'd have to check with the IT guy. He might have to go in and do something to, to make sure that the fonts are correct in the, for the uh, thing. That's, that's a little bit, um, 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 you know, that's a little bit beyond my scope of IT. I could tell you to turn it off and turn it back on, and that would be about the extent. Okay, so we'll... We'll make sure, like I said, I do uh, uh, print up all these, so I'll make sure, Tony, that I have the IT guy try to reach out to you uh, at the beginning of the week so you have that to make sure, because uh, especially for the midterm, I want to make sure you have that, okay? All right, any other questions on anything? Um, I know I had a couple emails come in. Um, modification to vehicles, good question, Pat. That would be something, too. Um, you know, if it's uh, the case that for a vehicle, um, you had to make that modification so that it's uh, wheelchair accessible or whatever it may be, 
yeah, that would be something that would be definitely a medical expense. Again, I encourage you. Um, it's kind of the way I learned uh, with the itemized and medical to really have it work for people is, you know, that's when you got to think outside the box and do a little research. Um, like I said, with the case of my uh, gender reassignment surgery, um, everybody thought I was nuts. And sure enough, I found the person a $22,000 deduction. And uh, I can say that that individual comes to me every year for taxes and hoping that I can find something else like that again. But, you know, I had to do my research, as I said, to make sure that they weren't getting anything beyond the base model. Okay. So that's one of those things that, uh, you know, you definitely have to think outside the box and great thought with the vehicles. Okay. All right. Any other questions on anything? Okay. Uh, like I said, during the break, I uh, hope everybody got it. Um, I did send out the answers on six through nine. Um, today, if everything goes well this time with making of the clip, um, I'll try to send out the clip today uh, with the homework and the uh, answers to the problems for 10 and 11. Um, I'd really like you to make sure you have those. Um, please email me or if you got a chance right now, um, but please email me if you would like me to send you a PDF printout of any of the returns so you can see where what forms were used. Um, again, these are the workbook problems, what forms were used, um, things like that. And I can send those to you so you can compare them to how yours comes out, where you have things at um, as far as different problems. Like I said, a lot of times I will do different problems. Uh, you'll see those on the classroom lectures that I record. So you have those as a resource too. Okay. All right. Um, I know I did have a couple emails and, um, you know, with people regarding um, the, the software and stuff, the software doesn't take a lot to get used to. I had somebody in my class that uh, got a little frustrated with the software. They know the tax law great. They're a great student of that, but they got a little frustrated with the software. And I know it's an adjustment. Um, it's very form driven, um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, what the IRS uses actually. Uh, but it's very form driven and so that it is in there to um, um, you know some of the other softwares are very interview driven where you're asking questions and it kind of flows things and puts things on there in this case you gotta know the law know the forms uh, know where the numbers go so that the calculations are correct and and i think it's great that, uh, that it's that way and especially for teaching you how the forms work and how the the, the tax law works okay all right, any other questions? And like I said, again, you know, make sure that um, you, know, you do um, get information, ask me questions. Um, I have sent you the written midterm um, with information on there and I sent the problems. Um, I will send out some more problem answers today. Uh, so we will have that, okay? All right, okay. All right. All right. If there's no other answer, or excuse me, questions, um, we'll call it quits for today. Again, this is going to be recorded. Um, so, you know, make sure that you um, can go back and review this. Uh, there's other chapters that are out there. So, all right. All right. Everybody have a good day. Um, have a good Thanksgiving. Again, the midterm is due the 21st, uh, once you have that done, so you can sit and enjoy Turkey Day. And then next Saturday, we will be doing the midterm uh, computer um, that we'll have you do right here online, okay? All right, any questions, make sure you touch base during the week, and uh, we'll try to make sure everybody's up to speed. Have a good holiday. Yep, thank you, Tony.